So again, I would like to welcome Brenda Lamy to our fifth session in the chat series, Leading Wellness. So Brenda has been at the Canadian College of Health Leaders since 2013. And she's uh, representing, uh, she worked with organizations and representing the uptake and integration of leads and leadership development programs to all provinces in Canada. Brenda led the, the fresh and launch of both the certified health execute and fellowship designations offered at the college and aligned both three designs with empowering leaders, knowledge translation and mentorship. Both programs have experienced record setting registrations since their respective launches. Most recently, Brenda led the creation launch of the groundbreaking CCHL Circle, an online platform for CCHL members within which members from around the world may connect, interact, and engage in facilitated evidence-based on-demand leadership development. Brenda held a cross-departmental associate faculty appointment for 12 years at McMaster University, DeGroote School of Business and School of Rehabilitation Science in their Master of Health Management program. She also had a progressive career at the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists culminating as Director of Policy and Standards. Brenda began her career in healthcare as an occupational therapist in an acute care regional health center, followed by providing pediatric occupational therapy in rural community care. Brenda, we are very grateful for your time today, and we're so looking forward to learning from you about the VUCA world. Well, thank you. Thanks for that. I'm just gonna share my screen and start, bring the slides up. Get my ducks in a row here. So welcome, and thanks for choosing to be here today. I know your time is precious. Uh, I respectfully acknowledge that I'm broadcasting today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, the photo on my acknowledgement slide is recent and is, is from the community I live in, and um, I share it today to honor its beauty. I respect those who have walked before me along with those still to come. And I reaffirm my commitment to forging culturally safe relationships on our pathway towards reconciliation. I'd also like to thank all the health workers, industry partners and leaders who worked and continue to work diligently to manage and lead through the COVID-19 pandemic. The efforts and ongoing commitment are seen, felt and appreciated. So um, just, disclosing that I work and am paid by the Canadian College of Health Leaders. <laughs> so getting into the content, I'm, I'm gonna go move relatively quickly because I know the time is short, but I wanted to level set on, a, on definitions around the VUCA world and just talking a little bit about the origins. Um, there is some discrepancy on where uh, VUCA started from. I was um, educated about the VUCA world by Doc, uh, Francoise Morissette, who's faculty at the uh, Queen's University Executive Leadership Program. And it made perfect sense. She said that the, the coins framed from the Vietnam War, and you think about it where things were unpredictable, it completely changed the face of, of how people um, experience war and whatnot. It was all those things. There's another story where it came from, um, the military compounds in the states and whatnot. So it, it has a military source, it's been adopted by business and now it's flowing into healthcare because it does make perfect sense. So the definitions here, volatile, liable to change rapidly and unpredictably, especially for the worse. Uncertain is not completely confident or sure of something. Complex, consisting of many different and connected parts. And unambiguous is unclear or inexact because a choice between alternatives has not been made. So you can see there's a lot of negativity around the VUCA world and that you can certainly <laughs> feel that um, working in healthcare. So when you're leading in a VUCA world, our job is to turn that negativity on its head and, and make something positive, pull the positive out of that complexity and uncertainty. So I want to talk 
a little bit and orient ourselves or to the Kinefin framework. Um, this is also from the business world, but is being applied more and more, especially during the pandemic in the healthcare context. You starting with um, the clear, the knowing, the management level of, of context. I'll di dive in a little bit more to what that looks like. The complicated where there's still, the answers are still there. They're still possible to know the right. There is a right answer. You just need to figure out how to get there. Complex is where VUCA sits primarily. Not real clear path forward. Um, you need to pull in a lot of different information, a lot more leadership uh, capabilities are required there. And then chaotic is, is the crisis. So the, and we also saw this during the pandemic. So this Kinefin framework is used to guide decision-making, but the first job of the leader is to figure out what context are you in, <laughs> you know? So it's figure out where you in, let what context you're in, define your leadership style because it does need to change and then move forward with your decision-making process from based on that context. So getting into what these contexts look like. So I'll start at the bottom level, the simple, obvious, um, clear, all sorts of different words, but you get the point. It's really easy. You start at point A, you get to point B. This is where I would say you need, you need managers. You don't need leaders because there's a real, very clear path forward and easy decisions to make complicated, you're starting to get into where you're needing a leader. You need someone who can identify and pull in expert opinions. You define different pathways, You and then the leader chooses the pathway forward. And then complex is a lot more uncertainty, um, no clear path forward. So you, the leader needs to start probing um, patiently, figuring out, okay, what is this path that we need to take and how are we going to do that? Are we, let, let's try this and this might not work. Okay, we need to pivot and go over here because that wasn't working. So a lot of leadership flexibility and patience is required. And I'm going to get into those leadership styles. We're going to dig deeper into those. And then chaos is the crisis. There, is no, there isn't an answer. Um, you don't, there is no cause and effect. It's complete chaos. You need the, the leader needs to act first and then think later. So it's um it's it's the crisis mode. And then disorder is when there it you don't you can't even figure out what context you're in. And this is where the leader comes in to try and sort sort out what's going on. So in the clear obvious stage, the leader's job or the manager's job, if you want to think of it that way, Sure, the processes in, are in place, delegate, use best practice, communicate clearly in direct ways, understand that extensive interactive communication may not be necessary. This is people know their jobs, you, it's distributed leadership, people can lead from where they are, um, but the barriers to this and the risks are uh, you get into a comfort zone. Um, people try to make things that are more complex overly simple people get stuck in their ways of thinking and they don't challenge the, the decisions. They just do their job. It's very rote. It's line factory working kind of things. Um, and then over-reliance on best practice if context shifts. So people just keep doing what they're doing regardless of what's going on around them. And then, so the response to those barriers as a leader is create, is flattening the hierarchy, you know, getting rid of that, um, What's it called? The, the iceberg of ignorance. There was a study done in the 80s where you've got the four leader, the leadership at the top knows 4% of the problems at the front line, whereas the front line knows 100% of the problems. So you need to melt that iceberg and have those communication channels moving. Um, and don't assume things are simple. You know, the things may be getting more complex and you don't recognize them and you need to figure out what that is and um, recognizing the value and limitations of best practice because best practices are always changing as you guys know. And there's a reason why simple is listed right beside chaos because what happens is the, is the managers sometimes get complacent, they aren't paying attention, things are building up while they're not paying attention and all of a sudden they're in chaos because they're getting thrown into complete unknowns because they weren't paying attention. Complicated is that first step where there are answers. Um, you need expert opinions to, to direct you in the right way. You le listen to convict, uh, conflicting advice and choose the pathway as the leader. The barriers are 
that the experts might be too confident in their opinions. You get caught up in the ana analysis paralysis. So you're just thinking and talking too much and not moving forward. Um, and that you don't call on the non-experts. So those people with the different points of view that are coming in and leaders may not be listening to the identified experts. So, so there's those are the risks. And leading in this complicated context is you need to encourage external internal stakeholders to challenge expert opinions. So you're having a dialogue and you use experiments and games to lead people to think outside the familiar because you're starting, you need people start starting to think outside that, that box. Complex, and this is the VUCA world, really. Um, the leader's job is to create environments and experiments that allow patterns to emerge. So you're starting to look for patterns and what's going on in the world around you. And that's your job to probe as a leader. Like, let's try this and see how it goes and then pull people back if that's not, and being able to pull people back and have that vulnerability of saying, you know what, that's not right. Let's go try this over here. Um, Increased levels of interaction and communication. So lots of dialogue, lots of opinions, lots of um, interaction going on and deliberately generate ideas like pull in, okay, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? How should we do this? That kind of thing. And you start, you're really experimenting at, in the complex VUCA world. Um, Leaders can be tempted to use command and control and say, this is what we're gonna do without listening to all that the, those opinions that, that they've been calling on. Um, leaders are tempted to look for facts rather than allow patterns. If they get one fact, they're like, obviously this is the way to go. We're gonna go here without waiting to see what that pattern is that's coming up around that one fact. And desire to for accelerated resolution. So people wanna to get to the solution really quickly when you, you need the patience and time to let the pattern emerge. And then, um, so your response to these bears as a leader, an effective leader in the VUCA world is be patient and allow time for reflection and use approaches that encourage interaction so patterns can emerge. So you're, you're getting people on the same page, watching for these patterns and that kind of thing. Now, this is very different. Like this is not the pandemic. In the pandemic, we were in crisis. You know, VUCA world is different than crisis. So chaos is crisis is leaders need to act and they can't wait for the right answer. They act first and analyze second. Um, so you look for what's working instead of seeking right answers. You take immediate action. You are in the command and control and you provide clear and direct communication. So it's very much emergency crisis. You know, when the building's on fire, you're not going to have a conversation about the best way out. You're going to, you're going to take control. Someone's going to tell you how to get out of the building and you do what you're told kind of thing. Um, barriers use command and control longer than needed. And this was the challenge we saw during the pandemic is that there was command and control, but when do you switch over to complicated? When do you switch to let's start having a conversation about the best path forward? Let's start trying different things because we're past that chaos point. And the, you know, the leader's job is to get you out of chaos, bring you into um, complicated or complex, sorry, from chaos to complex and um, but letting go of that command and control and the timing for that is can be challenging. And if you don't, the chaos is maintained because you're still pushing and making decisions and you're not a clear path forward and they may not be the right decisions. And it's a missed opportunity for innovation. And it's really interesting. It was an aha moment for me and it may have been obvious for others, but when you think of um, the innovation that happened during the pandemic, that was purpose-driven, there was no vision because nobody knew what was happening. We couldn't decide where, you know, where we're going or how we're going to get through this, but there was purpose. And it's it's purpose that drives innovation and not vision. And the purpose during the pandemic was that you saw innovation like we've never seen it before in healthcare. You know, overnight, I think uh, Chio, for example, had a three-year plan to transition to virtual care. And people thought that was too ambitious. They ended up doing it in three days. So, 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 you know, this, and they were, because there was a purpose, they needed to do this. There was no option. So you see this innovation that was just rapid 
and exciting and fantastic on many ways. So it's creating these opportunities for innovation. Um, and that, that's the leader's role in the chaos. So set up mechanism to fully utilize opportunities. You start seeing new ways of delivering care. Out where I live in Renfrew County, we had the virtual triage assessment center where paramedics partnered with physicians to create a call-in center to book your, your tests, to access family physicians. And they're actually now funded for many years because we have an underserviced community and anyone in the community can now access a family physician in a phone call within a couple of hours. Like it was this new way of thinking and Doug Ford has said, they're gonna roll it out across Ontario. So you've got these opportunities to do things differently. And that the leader's job is to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, but you also want the people around you as a leader to challenge you and challenge your point of view and say, you know, is this really the best way? And you have that open dialogue. And you're, as a leader, you're also shifting things to, from chaotic to complex. You want to create the pathways, have the dialogues, get out of that command and control requirement to the more patient pathway kind of thing. So, so that's the leader's role in pulling you through um, the chaos. And, and what you need to do as a leader is shift yourself from, so you have an example of Rudy Giuliani. He was he was praised for his response to 911 because he was very command and control. He took control. He knew what to do, but he's very criticized for the other contexts. He's not a great leader in different contexts. He's a good leader in chaos. So the challenge for the leaders is to switch your style depending on the context you're in. Um, at the college, we did rapid research with uh, multiple leaders from around the world. They uh, submitted their comments in a survey. We came up with these themes about how to lead in a crisis. And I'll share these slides. The links are live when you get them and you can go in and check these out um, for yourself. So it's how to lead in a crisis because really in healthcare, we've we, there's always mini crisis and there's always a VUCA world, but crisis that was across all health systems has never been experienced before. You had the supply chain, you had the, you know, the unknown pathway of the virus, you had the, uh, you know, you guys get it. There's so, there was so much going on. So leading in a VUCA world, getting down to the basics, um, you wanna go from volatile to calm. You wanna, you wanna create that certainty from cer uncertainty move to simple from complex, but keeping in mind, you don't wanna oversimplify because of that uh, Kinefin framework. And ambiguous, you wanna create clarity as well. So using leads, and you don't need to be familiar with the leads framework, but um, how am I gonna lead myself in this crisis? So in the Humboldt accident in Saskatchewan, the leader of that community came to one of our National Health Leaders Conferences and talked about how she used leads to frame how she got through the Humboldt crisis. Um, after the, she got the call early, early in the morning and she, had, she, was, she was driving in to deal with the media, to deal with the families, to deal with the health systems, to deal with everything. And she's like, okay, how am I gonna lead myself? How, she was devastated of course, as we all were, but how am I gonna be myself in this situation? What will be the most effective way to communicate with those around me? How do I need to, what do I need to say and how do I need to engage with them? Because we all do, you know, training and development around effective communications. What are the results that I'm working for? Like we're at the end point, where do I need to get, get to? What, what are the results I need? You know, starting to define and make clarity about this chaos that you're in. Who do I need to work with and what do I need to know? So fact finding, what are the politics, who's out there, it's the families, the hockey teams, the, um, you know, this is just an example. And then how will this influence the system context within which I'm working? So this is the big picture. And then you're, you think of from the Kinefin model, you're trying to create order out of this disorder and this chaos, you're moving into the complex context. Another way to look at it as leads as a change framework. So you're in this current state, you need to get to a future state. That's the, you're defining the result. Where am I going? How am I gonna lead myself? How am I gonna be with others? So those are your personal processes. Who do I need to work with? What do I need to know? 
what is the big picture systems transformation? That's the strategic processes. Those are re there's relationships and then there's change dynamics. And then through it all for you yourself as a leader is knowing your values and, and having your values as your rock and your safe space when you're faced with making decisions and operationalize your values. So what does it look like to live your value in these situations? And what does it look like to not be living your values in these situations? So that was a really quick highlight. <laughs> and we thought we'd move into some activities here. The first one is talking, I don't know if we wanna break into smaller groups, but I'll just walk us through what the first activity is first and I'll stop sharing. But we're talking about, or maybe we need the slides, unless you want to take a photo of the slide or something. So I want you to talk about the, the VUCA environment that in your context. Like what, what is the volatile, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity? And we'll get into what does it look like to lead. And in your, I just want you to sort of get some idea of the VUCA world in your environment. How was it different during the pandemic? Um, what do you want to maintain? You know, some people saw these opportunities in healthcare that we've never seen. And how do we keep that? You know, how do we keep this rapid innovation? How do we keep this momentum? Um, and what differences can you do without? What are you happy to move on from as we move into what, the endemic or whatever it is where our new future is? So I can, um, I'll stop sharing. I do that. There we go. And I'm, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know if we're all working in the same environment. So I thought I'd give you a chance to think about the environment you're in and start um, defining what that, what that looks like. So actually, Brind, I wonder, should we do a quick introduction? I think we still have a little bit of time. Is that okay? What do you think? So we kind of know each other's environment. Yes, sure. So yeah. we'll start. Well, do you want to do it or I can go around the screen based on like around the table? You can go ahead. You can call people. Yeah. Um, Heather. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Waters and I'm a family doctor working in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm an associate professor with the university and uh, outside of my clinical work, primarily involved in postgraduate medical education and in particular with residents and um, programs and situations of academic difficulty. I chair our education advisory board and I'm an, and I'm the director of resident support at, at postgrad here at MAC. Um, it's great to, to be here and to, to meet all of you. I, I think lots of new faces on this call for me. Thanks, Heather. And uh, Catherine? Hi, my name is Catherine McCleary. I'm with the Central Ontario Health Team for Specialized Populations, and I also work for Waypoint Centre for Mental Health Care. So our organization has undertaken uh, leads in a caring environment, um, mm -hmm. and the OHT world is definitely a VUCA environment. <laughs> I can imagine. Thanks, Catherine. Trish? Hi, everyone. Uh, Trish Nelson. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications with Home and Community Care Support Services, so a bit of a different group, I think, um, but likewise involved with some of the OHT work and working closely with Susan, actually, on uh, some work on this. And so the VUCA environment is, I think, I safe to say it's our world right now. <laughs> and so uh, we're trying, I, for me, this is just really helpful in, in getting some good insights for the work that uh, we're embarking on. So thanks for having me. Great, thanks for being here. Susan, familiar face. <laughs> the, one, the one familiar face in the group, hi. Hi, Brenda, nice to see you. Hi, I'm Susan Wright, Manager of Organizational Development with Home and Community Care Support Services Central West. And um, yes, I work with Trish, my colleague, um, when we're both co-leads for some internal projects right now um, with OHT in mind, and also uh, I'm co-lead for a leadership capacity uh, project internally, and, um, and I also am a leads coach, so um, a pretty familiar and biased towards uh, this wonderful framework, and uh, yeah, my pleasure. Nice to meet all of you. Thanks for doing this today. Thanks, Susan. Great to see you. Um, Ryan? Or I guess, Ryan, I'm sorry if I mispronounce. I don't know, Ryan. 
I'll just keep moving on. Uh, Rishikesh. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Rishikesh Nauri. I'm a quality improvement and uh, lean professional. Uh, great topic and uh, thank you for that presentation. So uh, I'm, uh, uh, I work in healthcare and uh, supporting community mental health and addiction agencies across the province um, based in St. Catharines, but um, my work is yeah supporting organizations across. So great to be here and uh, really interesting topic for sure. Great, thanks and welcome. Mohammed. Hi, I'm, uh, you can call me Mo. I'm one of the hematologists in St. Catherine as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the, the lead for quality and clinical utilization at Niagara Health. And I'm also the uh, regional lead for selectives at the um, Niagara campus uh, for medical students. Um, it's a great okay. topic and thank you for organizing. Thanks Mo, welcome. Marika? Hi, uh, I work for Indigenous Services Canada. I am the uh, manager of professional practice. And uh, this is all new to me. Uh, VUCA leads all of it. Um, I just feel like the, the actual word <laughs> VUCA is just, it represents my, since the day I started um, supporting, um, we, we do the, the nursing support for uh, remote um, First Nations communities. So great. Well, thank you. Welcome. And Mira. Hi there. Um, I am a, a pediatrician. I am the division head of pediatrics at Lake Ridge Health. Um, so just sort of expanding my knowledge base um, over, I mean, we've had so many leadership responsibilities throughout the pandemic. And it would be nice to put a framework to that to maybe make the work going forward a little bit easier um, or a little bit more defined, I guess, <laughs> would be nice. So new to me in terms of the frameworks and stuff. So um, very good. Thank you. Great. Thanks and welcome. So this is new for everyone. And, and um, you know, it, 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 it's a very quick introduction. You could, I could talk for days about leads and I could, you know, the Kinefin framework, you, there's whole courses on it. So you got a 15 minute primer just to, just to orient you to what they are. And then I, I encourage you to, you know, dive in and, and learn a little bit more because they certainly helped. Um, there was one example, um, Major General Scott Malcolm was tasked with bringing in the Canadian um, tourists off of the um, cruise ships in the absolute crisis of the pandemic. And he spoke to our membership about, he used Kinefin and he used Leeds um, to guide how he approached this issue. It was definitely chaos to begin with. Like who's ever heard of this emergency of bringing Canadians back from cruise ships, which is not, <laughs> you know, they're sort of okay, but they're not really okay. And you need to get them in and there's international law and there's all these different things at play. So he applied both frameworks. Um, so it's definitely useful tools as leaders to have them in your, in your toolkit and knowing when to, when to pull them out. I would argue leads is over, crosses over them all. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this first piece here talking about and maybe we'll just take a couple minutes and share as a group of, you know, um, what what contributes to the we all we all heard everyone say that, you know, definitely living in the VUCA world and what makes you think like that, you know, what are the examples, specific examples that come up and I'll give a generic one in healthcare. Um, IT is always changing. The technology is always changing. So this is this is adding to the um, a lot of it. So the uncertainty or the the volatility or the <laughs> complexity or the ambiguity because there's IT that can help you. How do you shift to this new IT? How do you get people to buy into it? How do you learn about it? How do you teach about it? So so that's just one example. And does anybody else have examples they want to share of what contributes to VUCA in your world? So speaking, and you know, this might apply apply to the uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, all of this, but thinking of, you know, moving things from those negative frame of reference to something more positive. So moving from the volatility to calmness, 
you know, under lead self, there's four capabilities, self-awareness, managing yourself, developing yourself, demonstrating character. And those are the, the four capabilities under lead self. And the same goes for engage others, achieve results, developing coalition. So what, I'll give you a few minutes to read through these, but read through it from the, from the frame of what, what would I need to do or what capabilities I think would bubble up in moving from a VUCA world to a, a more positive environment. Would you like us to comment, Brenda? Or give people a minute to look, but sure, Susan, if you want to kick it off, you're welcome to. Sure. Yeah, one thing I think um, that I've done myself and also encourage others um, just through dialogue, right? So um, Trish knows, right? And in, in, in having those trusting relationships or colleagues where when everything does feel a bit volatile. Um, it's always helpful to lean in and just have those conversations and dialogue. So I think it's a little bit about leading self and engaging others um, and also not being working in an island or working in partnership. So that coalition strategizing piece, I think, starts to come into play a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. I can share a little bit, Brenda. So I, I think starting with leading self is always good because as a leader you're not only you're engaging others and you're you help to manage others but also your role modeling behavior mm -hmm. you're uh, i feel that leaders and, and leaders doesn't have to be the one who has the role of the leadership doesn't have to be the division head or the director sometimes leaders are really the natural leaders in the team the influential individuals on the team and when there is volatility uncertainty having someone who is really grounded and able to bring that calmness to to the team to focus on what we can change what we know what we need to do i think that that is actually helpful for the whole team you're going to start to notice that the whole team starts to reshift and direct their focus to okay we have all of this that we don't know but these are the things that we know <laughs> we can do this these are the things that we can do or we can change so i think leading self i feel is crucial to to, to start with and in that self-compassion i think it's absolutely necessary i i have seen leaders uh, all leaders really are stretched so thin with the with the COVID crisis, I'm not sure what to call it anymore. It's like the complex, right? This is now we're in the phase of the complex world we're we're living in. Um, but that self awareness, the self management, the self compassion, and then engaging others and supporting them in their their wellness as well. So compassion towards other others. Um, engaging them and asking them how can i help you because we we cannot make maybe a long term strategy but today how can i make your day better mm. and they will share those small things that will that will um help identify how, how to make their day better in a meaningful way to them so in this small simple process then we can actually help achieve some results in doing this, you can get people to volunteer to pick up extra shifts, for example. In doing this, you can get them to stay a little bit longer or do more work than what's expected or support each other. I, I think these, like the, the leads framework and, and mapping this with the, with the VOCA framework um, is very, very helpful to, to try to focus on actions that we can do as leaders to support our team. Great, thank you. That's great insights. Mo? I, I will have to agree with Ines. I, I like, this is my first time with this uh, framework and I really can see it, um, you know, being a, applicable, uh, at least to my situation with quality and, and uh, uh, kind of building the foundation for quality improvement projects at, at Niagara Health. I, I agree. I think as a leader, you have to look after yourself and be grounded 
but I also like the fact that, you know, in, in terms of engaging and nurturing uh, relationships um, with, with uh, stakeholders. Um, as, as I took on this position, we realized that there's so much to be done and I can do it by myself. But I feel having a strong group um, of people bring that calmness that, you know, I'm not there by myself and give me that sense of peace as well. Um, and everyone is, you know, in terms of their experience and knowledge, um, when we have our meetings is just such a wealth of discussion of, you know, information sharing and, um, um, and, and it seems like everyone is engaged and, and those are people who represent their divisions, which will help, um, you know, set directions, for example, and, and take actions as well. And then hopefully eventually as the system transformation is that this is gonna be entrenched as part of the culture. Um, so um, I'm really impressed with this framework as, as I read through it, I think it's, um, there's a lot to, to learn from. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the, the idea is you move from the, the complex to the complicated to the routine and obvious, you know, you're always trying to make things as simple as possible, but it's the challenge of the leader to not make it too simple or, or to recognize when it's not too simple. Absolutely. Um, Catherine. Thanks. I, yeah, I was really interested in what you were talking about, uh, about that shift in leadership from the um, chaos to the uh, complex to the complicated to the the routine and like how do we emphasize that through the leads framework as we come out of covid so your your questions about what differences do you want to maintain what differences can you do without i would love to do without the burnout the health human resources the all of those things but i want to maintain the digital uh, translation and make it digital transformation so like how do we promote some of those things it's hard because it's you know we met I had a we had a think tank yesterday on um, on what to, how to move forward because the, the pandemic really highlighted the need for leadership in healthcare you know which is honestly has been quite ignored over the years I think um, it's one of the third largest leadership development is one of the third largest um, sectors in in um, private situations I'm sorry I'm losing my words here so. Private corporations spend a significant amount of money on improving their leaders and giving them the skills to lead, to make money, because they know that the better leaders they are, the more money they're going to make. Ironically, healthcare spends next to nothing on developing their leaders. They promote people um, because they're natural leaders. They don't give them the skills, the knowledge, or any kind of support. They move them up through the system. And then, you know, at the CEO level, expect them to be able to change the entire system and then fire them when they don't, <laughs> you know, and we may have seen, I don't want to get political, but we might have seen that happen in Alberta recently. I didn't say that out loud. Are we still recording? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's about building this, this ground, this groundwork of effective leaders. And that was been my philosophy. We need everyone to lead from where they are, regardless of title and take the leads framework and, and feel empowered and enabled to, to, like you were saying, Catherine, to keep these changes and, and influence or keep the digital or promote digital transformation and make that happen and feel empowered where they're sitting. And so you need leaders above you who are going to listen to you and engage in you in the complex and, and whatnot. And you also need to feel confident that you, you're going to be heard and, and speak in a way that people will hear you and those kinds of skills and, and having the perspective, perspective of systems transformation. So um, demonstrating systems critical thinking encouraging and supporting innovation, champion and orchestrating change. Like these are the skills at your level that you're gonna to have to embody in order to get the people around you to engage in those. So it, it's everybody moving in. Cause you always, I always think of, there's not one person in the healthcare system that doesn't want the system to improve, that doesn't want people to get better faster, that doesn't want a shorter wait list. Like we're all in this for the same reason and there's not, no, nobody would argue that. So we're all on the same page that way. It's how do we get us moving into towards that direction? And it's through individual leadership efforts. And right now we're really tired, or the healthcare 
system is tired, exhausted, burnt out. And what we heard yesterday in the think tank with ODHR leaders and CEOs is that before we can start this, this, you know, this march towards innovation and health systems transformation, we need to debrief what we've just been through. People don't, they need to talk about it. They need to make sense of it. And it's hard to do that in a group because we've all had our own individual experiences. So one-on-one -on -one coaching, time away to make sense of it, those kinds of things before you move forward. And that's part of, you know, leading self and managing self and knowing when you need to debrief and those kinds of things. So, um, so Mira, you were talking about mindfulness. Absolutely. Um, more self-aware and become a better listener, engaging in the team. And that, and that's, uh, that's fantastic. And I listened to a podcast on a scientist who studies mindfulness and she was absolutely opposed to mindfulness at the outset. She was a scientist. Mindfulness doesn't make a difference. You know, what is this mishmash, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then she started, she listened to a talk and then she started it herself and then she started to study it. And the actual proving proof that she's coming up with that mindfulness makes a difference is fantastic. It was a Brené Brown podcast. I can't think of the scientist she was she was interviewing, but it was fantastic. And then Heather here, clinical demands have been so great they compete with clinicians' limited time, energy, yeah, for attention, even when opportunities for learning are available. Managing resources for clinical care is key to free up. Yeah, exactly. And and um. The think tank we had yesterday, we were talking a lot about, we all talk about how our workloads are so heavy and everyone's workloads are so heavy, but nobody, like, how do you lighten workloads? How do you, you know, you have to create, you have to create positions, yet you don't have the money to create positions. Like, how do you actually lighten workloads? And these, this all contributes to leading in a VUCA world, right? I don't want people to think we're getting off track because this is about, you know, you've got all these pulling demands, but the supply chain issues and whatnot. So it's zoning in and focusing in on, um, on what you can control and what's within your control, the context you're leading in, using leads to move yourself forward, identifying the result you want to achieve one thing at a time, those kinds of things. And thanks, Enos, the great apps for mindless, calm, headspace, bright mind. I use calm myself every morning for 10 minutes. I do the same 30 day cycle over and over and over again. So it's, uh, it, that one's great. So we, we've got three minutes left. Does, does anybody have any, any last thoughts or ideas they wanna share? I'm gonna, I'll stop I, sharing. I wanted to share something about clinical loads because we we typically uh, get stuck in our thought process of, of that we need more people and we definitely need more people. We don't really think typically about what can we get rid of? What is the waste in our day? And we have a, a quality improvement expert here. So um, what can we get rid of? And I really loved your question, Brenda, for reflection about what is it that you don't want anymore, right? Like that was, I think the third or fourth question. What can you do without? And if we challenge ourselves to define one thing or two things in our day, that actually is a waste, whether we're seeking perfection on something. And that's, I think one of the qualities that we should stop seeking perfection um, and really be more agile and getting um, things done quicker and faster to meet the demands of this volatile and changing world. I think something that we could shift our thought process about, get rid of the waste. That's it. Mo, yeah. I was just gonna comment on Heather's uh, <clears throat> post. Um, I agree, I think, I think uh, leadership development should be um, part of our work, like it should be expected that you finish or complete those sessions. Not that I have to take time off to set aside to attend this this wonderful session, for example, or any of the other sessions um, that I have to sign up for. But it becomes more of an expectation, and I think also might have to happen early on in in during the training, um, whether you know physicians, nurses. 
that something something has to be entrenched in in how we train our you know everyone in 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 um, in healthcare. Uh, but I, I agree. I think this is just should should be a. a I, for me, it's just it's just an eye-opening experience, like just learning every day about um, new new techniques, how uh, you know to do better. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just um, to me, it's very fulfilling, and very achieving, and, and I, I I wish everyone has the opportunity to do that as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just to speak to Heather's point, I I agree. Great, thank you, Mo. And I'll just finish commenting that during the pandemic. We saw organizations pull away from the large programming. Understandably, they were dealing in crisis. We saw we had record numbers of registrations, CHE credentials, people seek individuals seeking support and help. And it was very inspirational to see our health leaders working front lines, doing all this work, yet always yet still investing in their own development and wanting. Like to me, it was their own money, their own time outside of their full-time jobs. And it this was our the leaders in our healthcare system to get through the pandemic. And it was just, I can't say enough about it of what we saw because we didn't expect that. And we were we were like we need to step up and support these people because they're <laughs> they need the help. So it was it was inspirational. Absolutely. So thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate it. Ines, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. And um, there, the links are in the chat. I will share my slides. There's lots of links in there if you want to dig in and find out a little bit more. So thank you. Have a good afternoon, Ines. Brenda, and thank you everyone. And join us for the next session. It's going to be about building leadership for wellness champions. Uh, across the board. So uh, hope to see you there. And thank you for engaging in such a discussion. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.